And here we go. So this topic goes through some of the aspects of berries, some of the fibers in fruits and vegetables, and I'm going to link this to the topic that I talked yesterday about the gut biome, bone broth, all of that stuff. But I think berries is one of those areas in nutrition where pretty much everybody is like, well, Bill Berries, yeah, it's pretty cool. Even Snoop Dogg approves. But I think one of the aspects that I looked for a long time, first in paleo diet, is that we need to emphasize more deeply what we are actually meaning when we talk about certain terms. So we are not eating terms. And when it comes to plants, it's really important to understand how we domesticated many varieties from the same plants. So this is a classic example that if you look at, let's say, a chiquita, you still see the small seeds, the black dots inside of the banana. But if we compare it to the wild variety, there is a huge difference. And we've been doing this for at least 10,000 years. And there is many upsides to these things that domesticating has provided us. But I think the general trend is that we've been more or less farming carbohydrates for a long time now, and not minerals and phytonutrients and these things. So you've all heard a phrase that an apple a day keeps a doctor away. Is my clicker working? Yes? But I don't think that too many people understand that that's actually how an apple originally looks like. And Yarrow was actually mentioning earlier today that he ate some of these, these kinds of apples when he first arrived here in Finland. But the key point in here is that it's necessary to understand the difference. Is this clicker working or not? The difference is in nutrient density between these varieties is massive. So if you look at the phytonutrient content, so phyto just means plant, plant nutrients. This is a wide variety of different types of compounds and chemistry that plants produce. It's not at the same octave. There is a huge difference. And even you can compare, let's say, Cranny Smith, an apple variety that's widely available everywhere, and some of these more sweet varieties that many people purchase. So, my topic today is around berries and pigments in food. And pigments are kind of indicators of a certain type of chemistry in plants. And through domestication, we pretty much breeded out certain alkaloids, bitter compounds, and the color pigments from even berries, which are in generally very nutritious foods. But if you, let's say, compare blueberries and bilberries, so bilberry being the wild variety of blueberries, um, the blueberries only contain this anthocyanin, these color pigments on a surface of the berry. And bilberries, it's fully colored. The whole berry contains these things. So, it's, so there's quite a bit of difference in every case where we look at the more wild variety that has more characteristics, more vitality in essence. And of course, that's because those plants need to produce chemistry to survive. They produce chemistry for defense mechanisms, for communication with other plants and mammals and so on. So this is just important to understand that this has been going for a long time. And if we say, let's just put that my diet contains these and these food, it's very important to understand what type, what kind of carrot, what type of an apple, what type of blueberries are you talking about? And this is um, one example. When I've been traveling in Peru, where potatoes originally come from, they have literally thousands of different varieties of potatoes. Some of them are black, some are highly pigmented in this same anthocyanins, for example, that we find in blueberries or bilberries. Same with, let's say, corn. You look at any example in a plant world, and we've basically seen that we breeded out 
some of these highly colored pigments. And why this is important is that these compounds are very good for our gut. And this again goes that Yaro was talking of, um, earlier about that he's not too big on prebiotics. Or, I mean probiotics, but prebiotics. And these pigments that are usually attached to fibers in plants work as a prebiotics. And we go deeper into that in a moment. But also an example is that even though chlorophyll, the green pigment in plants, is covering many of the other pigments in plants, they are still present in high amounts, let's say, in leaves. So I remember doing a blood analysis back in the days and eating huge amounts of spirulina and some of these very chlorophyll-rich plants. And my carotenoid levels in my blood were just off the roof. And I was like, I'm not eating too much, you know, carrots or anything like that. But I was getting those compounds from green leafy vegetables. So an example in that realm is that if you compare, let's say, a typical salad to the wild variety, again, there is a huge difference. This plant is much more bitter. And it's actually highly, highly medicinal, even psychoactive plant. So in the early 1900s, I think uh, some of the pharmaceutical companies actually extracted um, some opiates out from wild lettuce. So if you dry it up and smoke it, this is not working very well. This is pretty much what happens. So we're talking about salad. So just to make sure that everybody understands the difference that when we breed this plant, when we domesticate them, we get rid of these alkaloids, terpenes, strong compounds that work in our bodies much more strongly. And of course, we don't want to do too much of these. There are toxins, there are anti-nutrients, stuff like that. But if we start to make whole diets that are just based on these pretty weak varieties, I think that we don't really have insurance in a way that our biology has evolved for a long, long time. So there is one photo of, of the chemistry also. But this is important, to ask the question, what type of berry, apple, meat, you name it. The other aspect that I was covering yesterday is that you are not what you eat, but what you actually absorb. So, for example, with green leafy vegetables, there is um, quite a bit of difficulties because these cells are very thick, that we are not actually getting into the nutrients that well. So we need to break those by fermenting, by blending, chewing, choosing. There are many technologies that we can use. But this is one point that I want to also cover with berries, because many of these color pigments in berries and vegetables and fruits are actually fat-soluble. So if you're just eating a big salad, you are not absorbing too much of those nutrients. So always put some oils. Even if you press, let's say, a green juice from plants, always add a little bit of oil in there to enhance the bioavailability. And we can, of course, go to the word porn side of, of the things. I'm not sure this is... Can you change the slide because this is not working too well? So the phytochemicals or phytonutrients is a huge array of different chemistry that plants produce. And of course, we know a lot about these things, what they do, they work as antioxidants, this and that. And I think that one way to simplify this whole, whole world is to look at them as color pigments. Because if you think about certain chemicals, they present themselves biologically by certain colors, always, without exceptions. So this is kind of an um, old way of looking at things, or how kids could understand, like, this thing works in here, and this is good for your nervous system, blah, blah, blah. So pigments are things that we are after. And of course, let's say berry powders and medicinal mushroom powders, whatever are kind of concentrate of these things in berries, in vegetables. And I think 
one of the key aspects is also that we are not getting enough of these things. Because if, if you look at the science, for example, with berries, you'd need to be eating something like 200 grams, half a pound of berries per day, to really get the benefits, for example, from, let's say, bilberries. Yes. From bilberries that, let's say, in animal studies, induce um, brain-derived neurotropic factor, cognitive enhancement, stuff like that, make the proteins on your skin more elastic, very good for your connective tissue, stuff like that. But the amount is much higher than people are usually eating. So if you start to track that, that, you know, I'm eating berries, and actually look at how much you are eating, it's usually less than 100 grams per day. So I think this is necessary if we actually want to get the effect because we can be doing the right things, but not in the amounts that actually give the therapeutic effect. I'm not covering today like the idea that which berry is the best, because that's kind of a dualistic approach. Of course, all of these berries affect certain systems in our bodies, but I would say that C. buckthorn, from the scientific point of view, has kind of the portfolio of all the goodies. There is widest a range of different chemistry that works on different systems in our bodies. So kudos for that. Another point is that spices, as I mentioned yesterday, is one of the most underused resources that's widely available. Turmeric, all of these goodies are highly pigmented and do the same magic as the berries. Cacao, one of the foods that I do more during the winter time. It's kind of thermogenic, enhances a little bit of, of fire element in your body. And again, if you look at the novelty in there, those are pigments. Well, we've all heard about the dark chocolate, there's something flavonoids, whatever. It's the pigments. And unfermented cacao beans or the seeds of the fruits are super high. It's like 10% by weight. It's just these pigments, these catechins, epicatechins. And <laughs> I remember back in the days when I first, like 10 years ago, got some just cacao seeds and started dipping them into honey. And I was like, what's happening? This is, this is affecting my mood quite a bit. So usually, of course, those are roasted and it decreases the amount of, of, of the polyphenols and stuff like that quite drastically. But if you think about all of these things, few points. We need to get much more concentrated forms of these things, add some oils or fats to enhance the bioavailability, and after that we start to actually see the results like, okay, this is what cacao or chocolate is actually doing. This is actually what's going on up there. But how these things work is pretty much through our gut. So this has been one of the topics that we've covered many speakers in this conference has talked about. But for example, with chocolate, what happens? It modulates the gut biome. They work, these color pigments work as a prebiotics. They modulate the gut biome, and that's what happens. Now I'm lacking the, the font, or I'm not sure. Oh, they're coming. Let's go back. <laughs> professional. So, prebiotics are the thing that we are after when we talk about just colorful vegetable fruits, berries, and all of these. Because it's kind of the, the food for the good guys inside of you. As Yaro mentioned, it's just kind of that if you're just eating probiotics, it's just like you're throwing guys in there, but they don't have any food. So it's kind of hacking the environment, hacking the life that supports the growth of the good guys. And of course, symbiotics are fermented food stuff that contains both of these things. And I'm very much into, let's say, wild fermented vegetables, because you get very strong strains of back, good bacteria that are having a good environment to grow. And to make it simple, I think this is the key system that we need to hack. To think about food in more nuances, are you actually feeding life 
or actually, you know, against life. And this was a small intervention that one of the professors in the University of, I think it was in London, um, did for his son. Put, put him on a McDonald's diet for three weeks, and what happened? You basically lose the diversity. So you just make life more restricted. And I think this is what I personally experienced, that if you eat a lot of different things from diff every different kingdom of life and all that, the diversity of bacteria inside of you, you're much more cultural. I think that's also funny, the world, word culture for fermentation, for culture in general, you have just more life, more opportunities for life to explore itself. This is from, uh, I think, like a one-month-old study. It's one of the most comprehensive studies on microbiome that I've seen. But in essence, everything that we eat modulates the microbes inside of you, whether it was protein structures, fats. But these colorful pigments that are usually attached to the fibers, this is the thing that I think most of the people are still overlooking in amount. We're getting this but not in a sufficient amount. And again, measuring these things is more cheap, more available than ever. I think this is one of the places where you'd want to start if you want to understand your body better. So my key me message in here is that actually ask that question, what type of varieties you are eating? Not just that I'm eating berries, but is it like the phenotype of the plant? Is it strong that could survive in a wild nature? Or is it more domesticated and kind of weak? Because you are made from those characteristics. And we can talk about in terms of chemistry that's available in there, but also the bioavailability aspect. Add oils, extract those, use blender, fermentation, all of these that make the things more available. So we, we think and we visualize in color, and you are what you eat, you are what you absorb, eat more colorful stuff. And some of you asked for the presentation slides from yesterday. So this deck and yesterday's uh, presentation can be found from that, that website. So that's about it. Enjoy this day. and pick up something, whether it was coffee that you get these compounds from or any colorful stuff, but uh, enjoy. <laughs>